Good, thanks. Good morning. Um, as you will uh, notice if you look carefully at the program, um, there will be three engineers talking first and they will then immediately get out of the way to make sure that uh, you can do your work. Uh, <laughs> My name, is, uh, my name is Paul Verhoef. I am Head of Unit uh, Research and Innovative Transport Systems in DG MOVE. Um, my task is to fill in the so-called uh, innovation component of the transport policy. In general, um, let me come back to that. Let me first thank the Institute um, and, and Eurocontrol um, and the CESO Joint Undertaking for organizing this. I think this is um, very appropriate for the time. Um, there is a lot in technology coming, in transport in general, in aviation uh, in particular, and obviously we have a great interest not only to look at the technology but also to look at all um, the areas directly around it in order to make sure that this technology actually gets to the market and gets deployed. Uh, we see this as a, as a major, uh, as a major task. Um, we spend a lot on funding technology. Just to give you an idea, at the moment we are spending, um, in the current framework program, we spend more than four billion on the, on the EU budget side on transport research. This is uh, proposed to go up to, uh, to around seven. Um, obviously we'll have to wait what council and parliament decide and you will uh, appreciate that in the current economic and financial times, nobody dares to predict where we will end up, but somewhere next year, Council and Parliament will need to take a decision on, um, on the overall EU budget, among it the funding for the next framework program and in it the funding for, um, for the transport side. What is important for me is that um, in the future in research, we look in the projects also specifically at the regulatory issues, the legal issues, the standardization issues, and all the other things which uh, may come to the fore in the market. We see in quite a number of cases that technology is developed, um, things are moving forward, and then there are barriers in regulation or there is a, a lack of standardization, et cetera, et cetera. So I think we would like to start anticipating much more um, what is on the way. Obvious, this is going to be a lot. In aeronautics only, um, we foresee that uh, somewhere around 40 to 50 percent of the future funding as it is today uh, will be spent on, uh, on aviation, uh, which means that this is going to be um, possibly around 500 million a year from the community budget side, and this is usually matched by the industry in the same form. So we're looking at around one billion worth of new technologies only from the EU level, which is funded and uh, moving forward. Uh, this is complemented by funding um, of industry itself, of the member states which are funding. Um, so there is quite a bit, just to say, there's quite a bit of new technology coming in. And uh, obviously, um, there is going to be, going to be a, lot of, uh, a lot of work on that. Today I will not have slides for you. Maybe in front of so many lawyers this is a good thing, so it cannot be used against me. Um, what I would like to do is just give you a couple of elements we see in the space of what you are discussing here today and then leave it to you to, um, to, to take, take it under discussion. First of all, on the regulatory side, um, the single European Sky One package was in introduced in 2004. This was particularly meant to enhance safety and security, and efficiency, sorry, of air transport to reduce delays and basically get the system to function um, better and to decrease the cost. Uh, the cost of ATM in Europe are a serious problem, particularly for the airlines. The airlines are doing uh, pretty miserably, I think is the word at the moment. So the, the pressure to reform the ATM system on the one hand to increase efficiency and on the other hand to decrease cost is enormous. Uh, so we're going to need to, as a result, uh, look from those perspectives at, at ATM, which of course um, internationally has not been the case. It, internationally it has been the case 
first of all, that it is looked at how the first parameter was we do everything nationally. And then they were looking at the elements of efficiency and all the rest. A number of, of, of elements have been introduced in the meantime. Eurocontrol, of course, has started uh, having a responsibility at the multinational level, um, but very much um, at a sort of an aggregation of, of the national um, positions. Um, but I think an interesting case is, is, to, is for you to look at how the Maastricht operations are working in this, in this context where they have a responsibility for a, a, a broader upper level of, of airspace. Um, so there are, there are a number of, of examples there already. The single sky second package was introduced um, in 2009. This was uh, particularly to address the need to increase capacity and to integrate airports into the ATM system, and so moving to the gate-to-gate -gate approach, and um, to improve aviation's environmental impact. A few things which have been done is, um, in the meantime, is the introduction of the functional airspace blocks, which is uh, moving forward. Um, from what I hear, not always easy. Um, the underlying reason is uh, to optimize performance in terms of safety, in terms of capacity, cost efficiency, and environmental aspects. So here we see um, appearing one of the problems which is uh, rather typical European, at least for the moment, and the multiple levels of jurisdictions which are involved in that. We have um, the national responsibilities behind it, a number of international conventions. Um, we have a number of multi multinational organizations involved who are slowly getting responsibilities as well. And there is a large pressure to look at European airspace from a, let me say, almost single functional uh, perspective. And, and in first instance, not look at the national borders, but much more look at how can we increase um, the efficiency of the overall, of the overall system. Uh, which, of course, will then lead us right back to, well, but what, are the, what is the national jurisdiction going to mean in this? So there is going to be a very complex interaction um, between all these levels. Um, there is no, doubt, no surprise to you that, um, you know, the Chicago Convention, the ICAO rules on the one hand and EU legislation on the, one, on the other hand, and then the national situations on the third hand form a tri triangular which is, um, um, which is full, of, full of tensions and, and, and difficulties um, for, all, for all involved. Good, just to um, say a few more words on the international side, side um, to go give a, a few more details. We have at national level the national supervisory authorities. Um, they have at national level powers of, of control and responsibility. We have of course the ANSPs who deliver the services. We have uh, European rulemaking bodies, among them EASA. I think there are colleagues from EASA here. We have Eurocontrol at the transnational level. Um, Eurocontrol has a number of responsibilities both in the regulatory process as the network manager, as a performance revo review body, and, and all of this is, uh, is linked. You know that the Commission has recently put the first ideas on the table of um, how we're going to deploy um, CESAR, so that will inter possibly introduce yet another player in this, M maybe not, we'll see how it pans out. Um, we have the CESAR joint undertaking, which for the moment is very much positioned um, in the area of research, but going a long way towards, uh, you know, just stopping short of deployment, so to speak. But of course, a lot of things are, are happening um, with that. And then there are, of course, the direct EU institutions, Commission, Council and Parliament who have um, their roles in this. So, this is a space where you as lawyers, um, have a lot of fun, so to speak, uh, where you know we all need to look through all the all of these difficulties, and uh, we need to see how we how we can go um, forward. L let me give you a few examples of 
sort of more anecdotes of practical things which are in front of us, not necessarily coming from the CESAR side, which you will discuss in detail, but one of the things we have in front of us at the moment is um, unmanned aerial vehicles. Interesting topic, high level of auto automation, full automation with it, they can fly anywhere. Um, apart from the fact that we don't know exactly yet how we're going to handle them in the ATM uh, side as such, you know, this is, this is completely new, how we're going to handle that. If you look around the world, there are very interesting applications which are, uh, um, are being used, whether it is to monitor traffic or I've seen in Australia they use these vehicles to actually check the power lines and they fly al along thousands of kilometers of power lines just to make sure that the things are working. And obviously, this is not exactly what we need to do in Europe, but who knows. Um, it's just to indicate the technology is in principle there. Um, but we're all struggling to see, well, how we're going to introduce that, make sure that it can be used in a safe fashion, what are the rules which are going to need to apply, and obviously, um, you know, what, what, is, what is the liability regime uh, around it if the operator is sitting in one country and the aircraft is flying somewhere else? Um, one, one of many things um, which, is, uh, which is on the table at the moment. The other thing which was recently brought to me is uh, the issue of suborbital flights. Uh, also there, it is a very small market to be seen whether it is going to be something, but it is, it is new. There are a number of companies who think that this will bring them something, and obviously we're uh, sort of, let me say, fighting the usual competition with our American colleagues in order for the European companies who want to be in this area to do something. Um, a whole lot of things need to, need to be sorted out apart from the technology. Well, one of them is, again, um, the legal, the legal framework around suborbital flights, um, also the certification part of it, um, the ATM part of it, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So what do we have in front of us? We have, um, we have basically an absence of common provision of liability rules in, in, uh, in the single European sky. This is, uh, as far as we can see, uh, a weakness. Uh, we would hope that through this project uh, we can start addressing this, and we'll come to that in a minute. Um, we need to understand much better what, is, what, is, uh, what the current situation is, what the lessons are, we can learn from that. Uh, and what the new situation is going to um, to provide to us. So our sense is that the issues of liability together with safety need to be addressed in the early stages. As Colin has said, it is not going to be enough that people wave red cards at us and say this you cannot do, or even worse, that they tell us afterwards, well, if only you would have looked into this, you would have known that you shouldn't have done this which is even a worse situation. Uh, so I think what we're looking for is, is, is a lot of interaction with the legal community um, in order to also here come to possible new concepts, um, at, as a minimum get to better understanding, see what we can creatively do with the current legal systems and the current conventions, understand where possibly the limits are and where we need to uh, start introducing introductions. If this needs to be done, particularly if it needs to be done internationally, and I mean internationally outside Europe, at the global level, um, we're going to have to align all the European countries uh, behind those, those, those concepts and have them fight for it uh, jointly in ICAO and in other places. Um, so in that sense, there is a lot there. The other, in, the, the other dimension which I touched upon, but which I think is going to be um, very much to the forefront in the discussion for you the next two day, is, um, is automation. Obviously, the technology is pushing to very high levels of automation. This is already the case today. Uh, there are some who are saying, well, pilots are no longer pilots. They're not flying, flying they're just operating a computer. Um, I don't want to go that far, but it is, it is a way of describing, you know, the level to which automation has already gone in, in aircrafts. Um, this will continue. Um, the ATM system itself will be uh, much more automated than in the past. The example of the unmanned aerial vehicles, um, 
shows that we can go all the way. Uh, there, is, uh, there is thinking, let's be honest about it, there is thinking that by experimenting with UAVs, we can also see what we can do in areas where it's currently there are pilots on board. Um, how far can we go with that? How far should we go? I'm not talking about what the psychology for the passengers would be. Um, but there are some people who think that, uh, you know, maybe in the future we should be able to use full automation for, f for fright, uh, f uh, freight flights. Um, the technology, no doubt, can deliver that. Whether we should go that far is, is maybe a, a thing which is depending, among other things, on the legal situation, also obviously on the societal acceptance of uh, this being done, which is uh, a completely different topics. In essence, the relations between the humans and automatic systems is becoming more relevant. Uh, as I said, this is not only in aviation the case, this is everywhere. The example Colin has given, uh, we see everywhere uh, in the transport system. Um, to take a, an example, in rail, f for a long time it had been a no-no to introduce driverless trains. At the moment you see that they exist, not, not at a great scale, but in Paris some of the metro lines are driverless, um, some of the connections to airports are driverless. Um, you see that this is happening. On the roadside, you see at the moment um, the research is very advanced in so-called uh, platooning ideas, whereby there is basically one truck driving and there are sort of 15 hanging behind it, you know, with the drivers sort of sleeping while the systems uh, make sure that they follow the one truck. Uh, just to give you the perspective that the technology is there already. It is a question how we're gonna, how we're gonna be able to use that in the future. Um, So in essence, uh, just to sum this up, I mean, because this is the only thing I would want to say as an introduction to today, is, is we are very interested uh, in the work uh, which you're going to do. Um, we are very interested that there is a network of legal expertise in Europe for this, that we can tap into that, that the expertise is broadly available to all of those in, in this environment who need to do something, whether it is the various industry suppliers the, the su or supply industries, the service industries, the various players at institutional level. Um, but I think we jointly have a lot of interest in, in having guidance from you. Um, so I think we would want to try and develop this um, into a very solid piece of, of knowledge uh, which is available and uh, use your creativity also to see how we move forward. In particular, um, what interests us in the Commission is to see whether you feel there is a need to change regulations or either, either at European level or, or at international level where we would need to uh, engage. Um, I can tell you from my past work with Anna on satellite navigation, we came to the conclusion that maybe we should do something uh, where we have similar situation, maybe introduce a directive at European level to sort out the liability questions within Europe for the use of satellite navigation systems. Um, and hopefully go on a path for an international convention given the amount of satellite navigation systems which are being deployed at the moment knowing that this is possibly going to cost us 20, 30, 40 or more years uh, with no certainty that we're going to make it. Um, but it is another area where, um, you know, this is shown and obviously uh, here we're talking about, about Galileo and Egnos. We see exactly some of these things. I mean, we, we have seen, let me come back to Egnos as an example. It is, it is the first pan-European service in, in, in aviation uh, in, in air navigation which is provided. This has caused a lot of questions, a lot of difficulties at the legal side, but also with the certification. There still is a lot of question with certification. Um, I'm, well, let me, 
let me try to say this neutrally, but I'm surprised to see, for example, that at the moment we are still seem to have enormous difficulties with the certification of EGNOS receivers, although EGNOS has been developed over a period of 12 years. We've spent one billion on it, and it is costing hundreds of millions a year to operate. We still haven't sorted out the certification for the receivers. Um, we would like to avoid this in the future. No, and of course, certification is not necessarily your area, but it is, it, is, it is one of a number of issues which needs to be sorted out for the deployment um, of new technology. And I think we're going to, in Europe, have to do much better than, uh, than we do at the moment. So in that sense, I'm going to be interested to, to listen you, to you today. I cannot stay with you uh, for the full two days. I'm going to have to leave somewhere uh, later in the afternoon to go back. Um, but I wish you uh, a fruitful couple of days. Um, you can expect from us that in going forward with research in the next years, we are going to introduce, uh, as I said, not only in, in aviation, but in most of the work we do, at least my idea at the moment is that we will start introducing standard work packages in all projects we do. Um, and they can be sometimes smaller and sometimes bigger work packages on issues related to policy, regulation, standardization, certification, possibly um, accreditation in the area of security, so that we, from the policy side, have a much better impression of what is coming at us and what it is we need to do. Because if, and you know this very well, if we need to introduce regulation, this is going to cost us f four year, five years. Even if we have to change one paragraph in the regulation, it's going to cost us four to five years. So the earlier we know that we need to do that, the better it is and we can go about our work and get it done. Uh, so it means that um, we need to see out of the research, the technical research, we need to see what is it, what is needed to deploy this technology. And if we see certain patterns appear, then obviously we will then um, endeavor to, uh, to pick it up. So I wish you, uh, I wish you luck. And um, it's great to be in Florence, at least for a day. <laughs>